I've always been skeptical about the existence of ghosts, dismissing them as mere tales to spook children around campfires. But that all changed when I moved into that old, decrepit house on Elm Street. I got a good deal on it, but little did I know the price I'd have to pay. The day I moved in, an eerie chill greeted me, wrapping its icy fingers around me as I crossed the threshold. The air was heavy with a strange, oppressive energy. The realtor had warned me of its unsettling history, but I'd brushed it off, thinking it was just a gimmick to make the place seem more interesting. Night after night as I lay in bed, I would hear faint whispers, as though the walls held secrets they were eager to share. It started as hushed murmurs that I couldn't quite make out, but over time, they grew louder and more distinct. They seemed to come from all around me, as though a chorus of unseen voices conspired to torment me. One particular night, as I lay awake in bed, paralyzed with fear, I heard a voice right next to my ear, cold breath tickling my skin. It whispered, Get out. The words were so clear and filled with malice that I sprang out of bed, heart pounding. I checked every nook and cranny of my empty room, but there was no one there. As the nights wore on, the whispering turned into taunts and threats. I was not alone in that house, and it wanted me gone. My sanity began to unravel, and I questioned my own senses. I would often find objects mysteriously moved from their usual places, chairs overturned, and doors slamming shut when no one else was around. One evening I awoke to the feeling of hands wrapping around my throat, squeezing the life out of me. I gasped for air, struggling against the unseen assailant, but there was no one there. I felt myself losing consciousness when, all of a sudden, the grip released, and I fell to the floor, gasping and terrified. I began to experience horrific nightmares, night after night. I would see ghastly apparitions, their hollow eyes filled with an unimaginable sorrow. They would reach out to me, their cold, bony fingers grazing my skin. One night I awoke to find one of them hovering over my bed, its hollow eyes locked onto mine. Its mouth opened wide, and a chilling scream filled the room, making my blood run cold. My friends and family, worried about my deteriorating state, urged me to leave the house, but I couldn't afford to move again. I was trapped, both physically and mentally, in a nightmare of my own making. The hauntings escalated. I would hear my name being whispered in the dead of night, voices mocking me, their tones dripping with malevolence. The apparitions began to manifest during the day, not just in my nightmares. I would see them out of the corner of my eye, their ghastly figures lurking in the shadows. My sleep-deprived mind couldn't handle the relentless torture. I would often find myself in a trance, wandering the house, muttering to myself, unable to distinguish reality from the nightmares that plagued me. My once orderly life had crumbled into a living hell. One fateful night, as I lay in bed, paralyzed by fear, the apparitions materialized all around me. They reached out, their cold fingers clawing at my flesh. I felt their torment and despair, a pain so intense that I thought I might lose my mind. The room grew colder, and the air seemed to thicken with their presence. In that moment, I finally understood. These were not just ghosts. They were souls trapped in torment, seeking release from the shackles of the house. I had become a pawn in their twisted game. I left that house, haunted by the horrors I had endured, and with a newfound belief in the existence of the supernatural. It was a nightmare I could never forget. I remember the night I decided to dabble with an Ouija board. It was a dark, stormy evening, and the wind howled outside. My friends and I gathered in my dimly lit living room. We had all heard the legends of spirits, and our hearts raced with a mixture of fear and excitement. The Ouija board sat before us, an eerie-looking wooden contraption with letters, numbers, and a simple yes and no. The room felt colder, and a sense of foreboding hung in the air. Candles flickered, casting long, menacing shadows that danced upon the walls. We placed our hands on the planchette, our fingers trembling. I looked into the eyes of my friends, their expressions a mix of anticipation and unease. The room grew still as we initiated the ritual, invoking the spirits that inhabited the unknown. Is there anyone there? I asked, my voice shaky. Silence. The planchette remained motionless. Again, I summoned the spirits, this time with a little more conviction. If there's anyone here, give us a sign. Suddenly the planchette began to move, slowly and purposefully, 
spelling out words that sent a chill down my spine. Hello. We gasped in unison. It was the first contact with the other side, and a shiver ran through me. What's your name? I asked, feeling a strange mix of curiosity and dread. Malcolm Malcolm. It was an unfamiliar name, and we exchanged nervous glances. Malcolm continued to communicate, telling us about his life, his death, and the torment he experienced in the afterlife. He spoke of dark, malevolent entities lurking in the shadows, waiting to seize any chance to cross over to our world. As the minutes ticked by, our once hesitant hands moved more fluently across the board. We became entranced by Malcolm's words, ignoring the growing sense of danger that surrounded us. He told us he was not alone, and that he had brought other spirits with him. The room grew colder still, and the candles flickered wildly, as if fighting to stay alight. Shadows seemed to crawl closer, and a heavy atmosphere weighed down upon us. It was as if the boundary between our world and the spirit world was thinning, and we were all vulnerable to what lay beyond. My friends and I pleaded with Malcolm to stop. The feeling of dread had grown unbearable, and we wanted to sever the connection. But Malcolm resisted, refusing to release us from his spectral grip. Join us, he whispered, his voice a chilling echo in the room. Join us in eternal darkness. The planchette moved violently, spelling out a word that sent us into a frenzy of fear. Goodbye. With a collective gasp, we hastily removed our hands from the planchette and watched as it slid back to rest at the center of the board. The candles flickered and dimmed, and the room returned to a mysterious stillness. We knew we had made a grave mistake. The spirits we had evoked with the Ouija board were not to be trifled with. The room had been tainted, and a malevolent presence lingered in the shadows. In the weeks that followed, we experienced strange and terrifying occurrences. Objects moved on their own, and eerie whispers echoed through the house at night. We were haunted by our reckless decision to invoke spirits, and we knew there was no turning back. The Ouija board remained locked away, hidden from sight. I had seen my fair share of crime scenes in my years as a detective, but nothing could have prepared me for the horrors that awaited me on that fateful night. It was a quiet suburban neighborhood with well-kept houses and manicured lawns. At least it used to be. The case had come across my desk like any other, a string of mysterious deaths, all occurring within the confines of the victim's own homes. There was no apparent cause of death, no signs of foul play, just lifeless bodies in houses filled with an eerie silence. It was as though the very air had been sucked out of the rooms, leaving behind an unnatural chill. My first visit was to the home of a middle-aged woman who had been found dead in her living room. The house was tidy, almost too tidy, as though untouched by human hands for days. Mrs. Johnson lay on the couch, her eyes frozen in terror. The coroner's report came back inconclusive, no clear cause of death. The second case was equally perplexing. A young man had been discovered in his bedroom, his face twisted in agony. Again, no signs of foul play, no drugs in his system, just a life extinguished without explanation. The pattern continued with every new case, and it sent shivers down my spine. I couldn't ignore the growing unease that was settling in the pit of my stomach. It was as if an invisible force lurked in the shadows, an entity that defied explanation. The victims were of all ages, backgrounds, and walks of life, but they all had one thing in common. They had died in their homes, alone, and in the grip of terror. The local community was gripped by fear. No one felt safe in their own homes anymore. Rumors of ghosts and curses began to circulate, and superstitions ran rampant, but I was determined to find a rational explanation something that could put an end to this reign of terror. My investigations took me deep into the history of the town. I discovered that a century ago, the land where these houses stood had been home to a cemetery, and it had been hastily relocated to make way for the new neighborhood. It was an unsettling revelation, and it sent a chill down my spine. I delved deeper into the town's archives, searching for any connection between the victims and the land's history. That's when I stumbled upon an old weathered journal written by a priest who had once served the local church. The entries chronicled a series of unexplained deaths in the neighborhood during the relocation of the cemetery. The priest had performed exorcisms, trying to calm the restless spirits of the deceased, but it seemed that not all of them had been put to rest. 
The entries grew more frantic, the priest describing the feeling of being watched, of voices in the night, and of faces appearing in the darkness. With a growing sense of dread, I realized that the victims of the recent deaths were living in the exact spots where the graves had once been. The thought sent a shiver down my spine, and I knew I had to confront the possibility that the restless spirits of the past were exacting their revenge on the living. Armed with this chilling knowledge, I consulted a local historian, who helped me pinpoint the locations of the former graves. Together, we gathered old records and maps to determine the precise spots where the bodies had been reburied. It was a macabre task, but I needed to be certain. As I stood in the center of the old cemetery site, a sense of foreboding washed over me. It was as though the very ground beneath my feet held the memories of the restless dead. I had to find a way to appease them, to put their spirits to rest once and for all. My next step was to enlist the help of a local psychic someone who claimed to have the ability to communicate with the supernatural. We returned to the affected houses, trying to reach out to the spirits that haunted them. The psychic described a profound sense of sorrow and anger, as though the souls of the deceased were trapped, unable to move on. It became clear that the spirits wanted justice, a recognition of the wrong that had been done to them when their final resting place was desecrated. With the help of the psychic, we performed a series of rituals, acknowledging the pain and suffering they had endured. The atmosphere in the houses grew heavy as we made our pleas to the spirits. It was as though the very walls were closing in on us, a sense of desperation filling the air. It was a haunting experience, one that sent a chill down my spine. But slowly, the atmosphere began to change. The psychic spoke of a sense of release, as though the spirits were finally finding peace. It was a moment of profound relief, both for the living and the dead. In the days that followed, the hauntings ceased, and the neighborhood regained its sense of normalcy. The victims were never forgotten, but at least their restless spirits were no longer trapped in a world of torment. This case had been the most chilling of my career, 